So you might have a strong sense now uh, about um, the need for ethics in psychological research. Think about it. The object of study or the target of study in psychology is behavior in, um, in experiments, especially where uh, the experimenter has a higher degree of control. Um, you know, it's, it's tricky because we are working with human behavior or animal behavior, in fact. So um, it's, it's, it's a very delicate um, area, especially given the history of psychology, uh, especially in uh, Nazi Germany, where this, um, this, uh, where where there there was this aim towards creating a perfect race, and lots of experimentation that was extremely damaging, um, very harmful to subjects. You know who were very young children. Um, we'll, hopefully, we'll get to talk a little about that. But um, again, the point being here that given the contemporary um, uh, history of, of psychological research, ethics is something that is always on the table, and it should be on the table for the experimenter from the beginning of the study, from formulating the hypothesis, the research question, all the way till uh, until the, um, the, or the process of, of publishing it and publishing the results. Ethics are huge in psychological research. For this, uh, you should know the APA, the American Psychological Association, has extensive guidelines regarding the conduct of psychologists. And, and this is not only related to research. When we say conduct, we, 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 we are, um, this means the, the behavior that psychologists must have. Um, there are extensive guidelines, again, written by the APA. And um, make sure you know that um, the meaning of APA, American Psychological Association, and they are, again, the ones, I'm repeating, the ones that have, uh, that have proposed and have written and are in charge of uh, enforcing these guidelines um, for anything related to the conduct of psychologists. But a great part of these guidelines are uh, about parameters that researchers in psychology must follow. And another thing that is important that I mentioned previously is that um, it includes animal, animals as well. They are protected by, under these guidelines. At least that's the purpose of it. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, and this is not surprising given how much our society fortunately has progressed in terms of animals' rights and their protection. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, animals have their own section within the ethical guidelines for research, for psychological research, and they have a separate section uh, applicable to humans as well. Um, almost for certain, you will have to, uh, cr um, you will, they will ask you to uh, criticize an experiment in the, in the test, um, assess it in terms of its design in terms of its variables, operational definitions, whether they have, whether the conclusions that they can um, arrive to based on the design, and very likely you're going to have a part of it that uh, that uh, that is referring to the guidelines, whether it is ethical or not, what the researcher is doing. So from now on, from the moment you do your reading in the textbook and listen to the screencast, always be aware of uh, where design presented to you could be failing or could be improved, let's say, in terms of the ethic, uh, ethical guidelines proposed by the APA. Before we go into each specific guideline or the main ones, that can be grouped in specific terms that I will list in a minute. I'd like to, uh, for you to know, and, and please uh, consider in your notes the, that each uh, college or university or any type of institution that conducts research in psychology has their own IRBs. Uh, and uh, this stands for Institutional Review Board. The, this committee, uh, and Again, any institution, organization that conducts research of psychological nature has to um, 
become approved, has to be approved by the IR, by that institution's IRB, and they, this committee are, is the one that will revise very carefully, very fastidiously, in fact, that uh, the researcher is following the parameters established by the APA. Um, I, I believe that fed federal law also has their guidelines in terms of, of research, psychological research. And um, in, in the case of, um, uh, you know, it sometimes can be flexible, but the rule of thumb is that the researcher must prove that there is no other way that this research can be carried out if, if it's not that way. So they, that's something, again, what I'm trying to explain is that it's not that nobody is psychologically harmed, no animal is, is physically harmed in psychological research, but if there is a risk of at least of, of something occurring like that, then the re it's, it is upon the researcher to demonstrate that this is the only way that that, uh, that study, that those conclusions are carried out. And even more important than that, I almost forgot to say, is that if there is risk of, of harm of any kind, then that the, that the risk of, of harm or the harm itself is, uh, is evaluated in the sense that is it worth is it worth that a particular sample of, of people or animals will go through this in terms of the value that that research question has? So again, if there is risk and it will be approved, it's only because arriving to the conclusions from that study is, is considered to be of more value than the possibility of somebody or an animal getting harmed through the study. The uh, this section dedicated to psychological research is very extensive. You do not need to know it or memorize it. Uh, what you do need to know is it is, is what's uh, mentioned in your textbook. This is sort of a very quick overview of these terms and guidelines that you must know very well. Um, I'll go. I'll just list uh, through them. Uh, they are informed consent, freedom to withdraw confidentiality, do not harm, debriefing, deception use, exceptions and special situations. Informed consent. So have your notes ready. This refers to informing the subjects about everything that may influence their willingness to participate in the study or not. Now, something that you have to have very clear is that this does not, this does not mean that you have to reveal to the participant your hypothesis uh, um, or, or that you tell them exactly what the study was about, is about. Informed consent rather means telling, uh, providing, providing the subject or the participant uh, a detailed description of what they will be doing during this, during the study uh, so that he or she can can make a, an informed decision and and therefore consent uh, participating in the study. Again, you do not need to reveal uh, the purpose of the study, um, the hypothesis, but you do need to provide a very accurate depiction, sort of a snapshot of what the subject will be doing throughout the study during that time of their particip during the time of their uh, participation. This uh, informed consent reminds me a little bit of how, uh, um, um, you know, in roller coasters, I, I used to like roller coasters a lot. Um, they announce that um, this ride is, 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 you know, you will be feeling this, there's a risk of this, and there's a risk of that, and uh, pregnant women are not recommended to be on this uh, ride or anybody under a particular height or age. Um, sort of providing the fine print, but not as fine print, but rather here in psychological research, the fine print becomes very clear, needs to be clear, and the, so, so again, the purpose is for the subject to have an informed decision, therefore an informed consent, an informed, yes, I will participate in the study, or, or not. Any, uh, any subject, any participant in a study has the complete freedom to stop participation at any time for any reason, and they do not need to explain why, uh, nor should they um, 
uh, you know, they, they, they don't need to explain why they are deciding to participate in the study, to stop participating in the study. And uh, they shouldn't be, uh, they, they cannot receive any penalty for doing so. So if you, in the middle of a study, just for the heck of it, decide, well, of course, um, there's some ethics there too. You, you're supposed to be collaborating with the expansion of knowledge in the field, but um, you, do not, you do not need to reveal your uncomfort or your decision to stop participating in the study. Confidentiality um, basically refers to uh, the identity of each subject or participant in the study and the results of whatever um, uh, of per, uh, the results of their participation in the study, meaning if, if, if the study involves a measurement of IQ, no one should know that you, uh, you know, that if I participate in a study, no one should know that Ron Sarkos, if I don't want to, um, my IQ score um, it, it belongs to a person called Ron Sarkos because my identity should be protected under this confidentiality guideline. Uh, so, again, I, I'm repeating the terms because you do need to use them um, exactly as they are, in, in meaning you, let's say you're going to criticize one, um, I'm using criticize, uh, I know it's a, uh, a point out in a study that the identity of the subjects was not protected. You should say instead uh, the researcher should ensure confidentiality for each participant or for the identity of each participant. That's why I keep those, uh, like, play with those words. Um, now, again, uh, about confidentiality, the scores and measurements of any type of data provided by the subjects as a group will be made public. That's no problem with that. What, what the researcher cannot show or share with anybody else is that your particular score is this, your particular information is this, you behaved this way in a particular study because, again, each individual participant is protected under this clause of confidentiality. This one comes as uh, very uh, obvious. However, uh, when uh, this guideline or the summary of, of several guidelines uh, is that uh, no one should be harmed, uh, no one can, can be harmed, or, uh, and by harm it's not only physical, although with animals it means mostly physical, although I, I think, yeah, there, there's a, de I erase that, there, there are plenty of, of psychological uh, damaging activities that, that animals should not go through and, and that they're protected for. But uh, subjects cannot suffer any distress or go through any significant um, discomfort. And, and this is not subjective. I mean, the IR, the, each IRB, the IRB for any institution or any other supervisory role will, will go through this design to make sure that anyone, uh, that, sorry, that everyone is protected in terms of not being harmed either psychologically, emotionally, or physically. No one should go through physical pain um, unless they're willing to. Um, but again, exceptions are very rare, and they must be highly supported or very in, supported in detail as to why that is the only way that that uh, conclusion can be or that that question can be answered, the research question I'm, I'm referring to. In social psychology, once we get to that unit, you'll see that most experiments involved um, involve deception. We'll get to that in a minute. But debriefing refers to, I'll, I'll explain why I made that quick note. Debriefing refers to when the experiment is over, the researcher uh, or, or the assistants or people, uh, you know, administering, uh, administering, yeah, administering the experiment uh, need to explain what the study was about. Uh, and and this is where the deception um, comes in handy because if deception was used, which is normally used, um, subjects need to be told that they were basically lied to and, um, and so that they can, you know, feel that, oh, okay, now I understand the why. Uh, it's, it's like candid camera when they tell the person, hey, no, it's just a joke. And, um, of course, you guys perhaps don't know what Candid Camera is, but it used to be a show a long time ago. Uh, if Confederates are used, 
Confederate. It's a very important term that you should know. We spoke about that in class, but I'm going to write it here. Confederate is someone that is acting in as a participant, but truly is not, and is, is in, in terms of the, the entire study. They're, they are there uh, to have a role to pretend to be a participant. If this, that's the case, then the, the, the subject participant, after finishing the study, should be told that there were Confederates in the study. It's sort of the briefing see it as colloquially as the researcher has to come clean. And again, I just wanted to associate that during the debriefing, if deception is used, social psychology, in order to have a spontaneous reaction or or in, or, or, or a behavior that can be valid, it, the, the participant ideally should not have any idea of what it is about, right? We don't want to have a design with, what's it called? When the participant figures out what the study is about and is going to modify their behavior accordingly, we don't want the study to have demand characteristics. So um, deception is used to counteract for demand ca ca characteristics, and, but you have to tell. In the debriefing se session, the, the researcher, in, through its debrief debriefing, must inform the subject if any deception or, or use of confedera confederates wa was, uh, was part of the uh, study. As I mentioned previously in the screencast, there are exceptions. And uh, this is determined by, you know, by each study, by the institution they're working for, by the, uh, I mean, by the institution review board, by the IRB, and um, the exceptions are applied, of course, on a case-to-case -case basis, and um, and and they approve it or not. The IRB is who who that committee is going going to have the final word as to whether your design is accepted or not. And therefore, can be um, can be carried out. Um, now, exceptions in sometimes can, exceptions or special situations can be can can make guidelines more strict. What do I mean by strict? Well, if uh, let's say in the case of the research. Uh, studying or examining or measuring a behavior or attitudes for special populations, meaning um, that part of the population that is more vulnerable, right, like children, minors in general, um, elderly, or, or clinical subjects. Uh, that's important to know, clinical subjects. If it involves clinical subjects, um, people who suffer from a psychological or physical disorder or, or handicap, um, must, uh, of course, the, it makes sense that the guidelines are going to be more strict in their application, right? And, uh, but um, it can also, if, if the researcher, let's say uh, the researcher wants to study a population that is not clinical, that does not form part of these vulnerable segments of the population, then, um, and the research question is one, that carries a lot of strength in terms of we, this is very important for society to know, for the academic society to know, and society in general, then in some cases, some guidelines can be waived. And of course, there's a lot of documentation, there's a lot of pilot studying that must be carried out to demonstrate that that is the only way that this design that may carry the risk of harm or any other types of risks um, can be waived, but again, that's upon approval of the APA uh, via the IRB of that institution that you're working with. That's all for uh, ethics and psychological research. Of course, don't rely only on this. If you find any discrepancy between what I said or what's in your textbook, please let me know in advance. And I think this is one of the easiest sections, though, of of the chapter of that of the entire unit. Um, however, again, it's important to really have those terms down packed. All right. Thank you.